Hansel and Gretel Near a great forest there lived a poor woodcutter and his wife and his two children. The boy's name was Hansel and the girl's Gretel. They had very little to eat and once, when there was a great dearth in the land, the man could not even gain the daily bread. As he lay in bed one night thinking of this and tossing and turning, he sighed heavily and said to his wife, What will become of us? We cannot even feed our children. There is nothing left for ourselves. I will tell you what, husband. We will take the children early in the morning into the forest where it is thickest. We will make them a fire and we will give each of them a piece of bread. Then we will go to our work and leave them alone. They will never find the way home again, and we shall be quit of them. No, wife, I cannot do that. I cannot find it in my heart to take my children into the forest and leave them there alone. The wild animals would soon come and devour them. Oh, you fool. Then we will all four starve. You had better get the coffins ready and she left him no peace until he consented. But I really pity the poor children. The two children had not been able to sleep for hunger and had heard what their stepmother had said to their father. Gretel wept bitterly <laughs> and said to Hansel, It is all over with us. Do be quiet, Gretel, said Hansel. And do not fret, I will manage something. And when the parents had gone to sleep, he got up, put on his little coat, and opened the back door and slipped out. The moon was shining brightly, and the white flints that lay in front of the house glistened like pieces of silver. Hansel stooped and filled the little pocket of his coat as full as it would hold. Then he went back again and said to Gretel, Don't cry, Gretel and go to sleep quietly, and God will help us. And he laid himself down again in his bed. When the day was breaking, and before the sun had risen, the wife came and awakened the two children, saying, Get up, you lazy bones. We are going into the forest to cut wood. Then she gave them each a piece of bread, and said, That is for dinner and you must not eat it before then, for you will get no more. Gretel carried the bread under her apron, for Hansel had his pockets full of the flints. Then they set off all together on their way to the forest. When they had gone a little way, Hansel stood still and looked back towards the house. And this he did again and again, until his father said to him, Hansel! What are you looking at? Take care, do not forget your legs. Oh, oh, father, I am looking at the white little kitten who is sitting on the roof to bid me goodbye. You young fool, that is not your kitten, but the sunshine on the chimney pot. Of course, Hansel had not been looking at his kitten, but had been taking every now and then a flint from his pocket and dropping it on the path. When they reached the middle of the forest, the father told the children to collect wood to make a fire to keep them warm, and Hansel and Gretel gathered brushwood enough for a little mountain, and then it was set on fire. And when the flame was burning quite high, the wife said, Now lie down by the fire and rest yourselves, you children, and we will go and cut wood. And when we are ready, we will come and fetch you. So Hansel and Gretel sat by the fire, and at noon they each ate their pieces of bread. They thought their father was in the wood all the time, as they seemed to hear the strokes of the axe. But really it was only a dry branch hanging from a withered tree that the wind moved to and fro. So when they had stayed there a long time, their eyelids closed with weariness, and they fell asleep. 
When at last they woke, it was night, and Gretel began to cry and said, How shall we ever get out of this wood? But Hansel comforted her, saying, Wait a little while longer until the moon rises, and then we can easily find our way home. And when the full moon got up, Hansel took his little sister by the hand and followed the way where the flint stones shone like silver and showed them the road. They walked on the whole night through, and at the break of day they came to their father's house. They knocked at the door, and when the wife opened it and saw it was Hansel and Gretel, she said, You naughty children! Why did you sleep so long in the wood? We thought you were never coming home again. But the father was glad, for it had gone to his heart to leave them both in the woods alone. Not very long after that, there was again great scarcity in those parts, and the children heard their mother say at night in bed to their father, Everything is finished up. We have only half a loaf, and after that the tale comes to an end. The children must be off. We will take them farther into the wood this time, so that they shall not be able to find their way back again. There is no other way to manage. The man felt sad at heart, and he thought, It would be better to share one's last morsel with one's children. But the wife would listen to nothing that he said, but scolded and reproached him. When a man has given in once, he must do it a second time. But the children were not asleep, and had heard all the talk. When the parents had gone to sleep, Hansel got up to go out and get more flint stones as he did before. But the wife had locked the door, and Hansel could not get out. But he comforted his little sister and said, Don't cry, Gretel, and go to sleep quietly, and God will help us. Early the next morning, the wife came and pulled the children out of bed. She gave them each a little piece of bread, less than before, and on the way to the wood, Hansel crumbled the bread in his pocket and often stopped to throw a crumb on the ground. Hansel, what are you stopping behind and staring for? I am looking at the white little kitten who is sitting on the roof, answered Hansel. You fool, that is no pigeon, but the morning sun shining on the chimney pots. Hansel went on as before and strewed breadcrumbs all along the road. The woman led the children far into the wood, where they had never been before in all their lives. And again there was a large fire made, and the mother said, Sit still there, you children. And when you are tired, you can go to sleep. We are going into the forest to cut wood. And in the evening, when we are ready to go home, we will come and fetch you. So when noon came, Gretel shared her bread with Hansel, who had strewn his along the road. Then they went to sleep, and the evening passed, but no one came for the poor children. When they awoke, it was dark again, and Hansel comforted his little sister and said, Wait a little, Gretel, until the moon gets up. Then we shall be able to see our way home by the crumbs of bread that I have scattered along it. So when the moon rose, they got up, but they could find no crumbs of bread, for the birds of the woods and of the fields had come and picked them up. Hansel thought they might find the way all the same, but they could not. They went on all that night, and the next day from morning until evening, but they could not find the way out of the wood, and they were very hungry, for they had nothing to eat but the few berries they could pick up. And when they were so tired that they could no longer drag themselves along, they lay down under a tree and fell asleep. It was now the third morning since they had left their father's house. They were always trying to get back to it, but instead of that, 
they only found themselves further in the wood. And if help did not soon come, they would have starved. About noon they saw a pretty snow-white bird sitting on a bough, and singing so sweetly that they stopped to listen. And when he had finished, the bird spread his wings and flew before them, and they followed after him until they came to a little house, and the bird perched on the roof. And when they came near, they saw that the house was built of bread, and roofed with cakes, and the window was of transparent sugar. We will have some of this, said Hansel, and make a fine meal. I will eat a piece of the roof, Gretel, and you can have some of the window. That will taste sweet. So Hansel reached up and broke off a bit of the roof, just to see how it tasted. And Gretel stood by the window and gnawed at it. Then they heard a thin voice call out from inside, Nibble, nibble, like a mouse. Who is nibbling at my house? And the children answered, Never mind, it is just the wind. And they went on eating, never disturbing themselves. Hansel, who found that the roof tasted quite nice, took down a great piece of it, and Gretel pulled out a large round window pane, and sat herself down and began to eat. Then the door opened, and an old woman came out, leaning on a crutch. Hansel and Gretel felt quite frightened, and let fall what they had in their hands. The old woman, however, nodded her head and said, Ah, my dear children, how come you here? You must come indoors and stay with me. You'll be no trouble. So she took them each by the hand and led them into her little house. There they found a good meal laid out of milk and pancakes with sugar, apples and nuts. After that, she showed them two white little beds, and Hansel and Gretel laid themselves down on them and thought they were in heaven. The old woman, although her behavior was so kind, was a wicked witch who lay in wait for children and had built the little house on purpose to entice them. When they were once inside, she would kill them, cook them, and eat them, and then it was a feast day for her. The witch's eyes were red, and she could not see very well, but she had a very keen sense of smell, like a beast, and knew very well when human creatures were near. When she knew that Hansel and Gretel were coming, she gave a spiteful laugh, and said <laughs> triumphantly, I have them! They shall not escape me! Early in the morning, before the children were awake, she got up to look at them. And as they lay sleeping so peacefully, with round, rosy cheeks, she said to herself, What a fine feast I shall have! Then she grasped Hansel with her withered hand, and led him into a little stable, and shut him up behind the grating. Let me out! Let and me call out. and scream as he might, it was no Let good. Me out. Then she went back to Gretel, and shook her, crying, Get up, lazy bones! Fetch water and cook something nice for your brother. He is outside in the stable and must be fattened up. And when he's fat enough, I will eat him! Gretel began to weep bitterly, but it was of no use. She had to do what the wicked witch bade her. And so the best kind of food was cooked for poor Hansel, while Gretel got nothing but crab shells. Each morning the old woman visited the little stable and cried, Hansel, stretch out your little finger so I may tell if you'll be soon fat enough. Hansel, however, used to hold out a little bone, and the old woman, who had weak eyes, could not see what it was, and supposing it to be Hansel's finger, wondered very much that it was not getting fatter. When four weeks had passed, and Hansel seemed to remain so thin, she lost patience and could wait no longer. Now then, Gretel! <laughs> Be quick and draw water! Be 
cancel that or be he lean. Tomorrow I must kill and cook him. Oh, what a grief for the poor little sister to have to fetch water, and how the tears flowed down over her cheeks. Dear God, pray help us. If we had been eaten by wild beasts in the wood, at least we should have died together. Ha! Spare me your lamentations. They're of no use. Early next morning, Gretel had to get up, make the fire, and fill the kettle. First, we will do the baking. I've heated the oven already and kneaded the dough. She pushed poor Gretel towards the oven, out of which the flames were already shining. Creep in and see if it's properly hot, so that the bread may be baked. And Gretel once in, she meant to shut the door upon her and let her be baked, and then she would have eaten her. But Gretel perceived her intention and said, I don't know how to do it. How shall I get in? Stupid goose! The opening is big enough, do you see? I can get in myself! And she stooped down and put her head in the oven's mouth. Then Gretel gave her a push so that she went in further and she shut the iron door upon her and put up the bar. Oh, how frightfully she howled! But Gretel ran away and left the wicked witch to burn miserably. Gretel went straight to Hansel, opened the stable door and cried, Hansel, we are free, we are free. The old witch is dead. We are free. Then out flew Hansel like a bird from its cage as soon as the door was opened. How rejoiced they both were. How they fell on each other's neck and danced about and kissed each other. And as they had nothing more to fear, they went all over the old witch's house and in every corner there stood chests of pearls and precious stones. This is something better than flint stones, said Hansel, and he filled his pockets, and Gretel, thinking that she could also like to carry something home with her, filled her apron full. Now away we go, if we could only get out of the witch's wood. When they had journeyed a few hours, they came to a great piece of water. We can never get across this. I see no stepping stones and no bridge. And there is no boat either. But here comes a white duck. If I ask her, she will help us over. Duck, duck, here we stand. Hansel and Gretel on the land. Stepping stones and bridge we lack. Carry us over on your nice white back. And the duck came accordingly. And Hansel got upon her and told his sister to come too. No, that would be too hard upon the duck. We can go separately, one after the other. And that was how it was managed. And after that they went on happily until they came to the wood and the way grew more and more familiar. Till at last they saw in the distance their father's house. Then they ran till they came up to it, rushed in at the door, and fell on their father's neck. The man had not had a quiet hour since he left his children in the wood, but now their stepmother was dead. And when Gretel opened her apron, the pearls and precious stones were scattered all over the room, and Hansel took one handful after another out of his pocket. Then was all care at an end, and they lived in great joy together. The End The Fox and the Horse A peasant once had a faithful horse, but it had grown old and could no longer do its work. Its master begrudged it food and said, I can't use you anymore. But I still feel kindly towards you, and if you should show yourself strong enough to bring me a lion, I will keep you to the end of your days. But away with you now, out of my stable. 
and he drove it out into the open country. Now the poor horse was very sad, and went into the forest to get a little shelter from the wind and weather. There he met a fox, he said. Say, why do you hang your head and wander around by yourself there, Mr. Horse? Alas, avarice and honesty cannot live together. My master has forgotten all the service I have done him for these many years. And because I can no longer plow, he will no longer feed me. And he's driven me away. Well, without any consideration of any kind? Only the poor consolation of telling me that if I was strong enough to bring him a lion, he would keep me. But he knows well enough that that task is beyond me. Then the fox said, Yeah, but I will help you. Just lie down here and stretch your legs out as if you were dead. The horse did as he was told, and the fox went to the lion's den not far off, and said, Hey, there's a dead horse out there. Come along with me, and you will have a rare meal. The lion went with him, and when they got up to the horse, the fox said, You can't eat it here in comfort. I'll tell you what. I'll tie it to you, and you can drag it away to your den, and enjoy it at your leisure. The plan pleased the lion, and he stood quite still, close to the horse, so that the fox could fasten them together. But the fox tied the lion's legs together with the horse's tail, and twisted and knotted it so that it would be quite impossible for it to become undone. When he had finished his work, he patted the horse on the shoulder and said, Pull, old gray, pull! Then the horse sprang up and dragged the lion away behind him. The lion roared in his rage so that all the birds in the forest were terrified and flew away. But the horse let him roar and never stopped till he stood before his master's door. When the master saw him, he was delighted and said to him, You shall stay with me and have a good time as long as you live. And so his master fed him well until the end of his days. The End The Dragon's Grandmother There was a great war in which the king had many soldiers, but he gave them small pay, so small that they could not live upon it. Three of them agreed amongst themselves to desert. One of them said to the others, if we are caught, we shall be hanged on the gallows. How shall we manage it? Another said, Look at that great cornfield. If we were to hide ourselves there, no one could find us. The troops are not allowed to enter it, and tomorrow they are to march away. So they crept into the cornfield. But the troops did not march away, but remained lying all around about it. They stayed in the corn for two days and two nights, and were so hungry that they all but died. But if they had come out, their death would have been certain. Then one said, What is the use of all deserting if we have to perish miserably here? Just then, a fiery dragon came flying to the earth, and it came down to them and asked why they had concealed themselves in the cornfield. They answered, We are three soldiers who have deserted because the pay was so bad, and now we shall have to die of hunger if we stay here, or to dangle on the gallows if we go out. If you will serve me for seven years, I will convey you through the army so that no one shall seize you. Well, then we have no choice but are compelled to accept then. Then the dragon caught hold of them with his claws and carried them away through the air over the army and put them down again on the earth far from it. But the dragon was no other than the devil. He gave them a small whip and said, Whip with it and crack it, and then as much gold will spring around you as you can wish for, and you can live like great lords and keep horses and carriages but when the seven years comes to an end, you are my property! <laughs>
Then he put before them a book, which they were all three forced to sign. I will, however, set you a riddle, and if you can guess that, you shall be free and released from my power. <laughs> then the dragon flew away from them, and they went away with their whip, had gold in plenty, ordered themselves rich apparel, and traveled about the world. Wherever they were, they lived in pleasure and magnificence, rode on horseback, drove in carriages, ate and drank, but did nothing wicked. The time slipped quickly away, and when the seven years were coming to an end, two of them were terribly anxious and alarmed. But the third took the affair easily and said, Brothers, do not fear. My head is sharp enough. I shall guess the riddle. They went out into the open country and sat down, and the other two pulled sorrowful faces. Just then an old woman came up to them and inquired why they were so sad. Alas, how can that concern you? After all, you cannot help us. Who knows? Why don't you tell me your problem? So they told her that they had been the devil's servants for nearly seven years, and that he had provided them with gold as plentifully as if it had been blackberries, but that they had sold themselves to him and were forfeited to him, if at the end of the seven years they could not guess a riddle. The old woman said, If you are to be saved, one of you must go into the forest. There he will come to a fallen rock, which looks like a little house. He must enter that, and then he will obtain help. The two melancholy ones thought to themselves, <coughs> That still will not save us, and stayed where they were. But the third, the merry one, got up and walked out into the forest until he found the rock house. In the little house, however, a very old woman was sitting, who was indeed the dragon's grandmother, and she asked the soldier where he had come from and what he wanted there. He told her everything that had happened, and as he pleased her well, she had pity on him and said that she would help him. She lifted up a great stone which lay above the cellar and said, Conceal yourself there. You can hear everything that is said here. Only sit still and do not stir. When the dragon comes, I will question him about the riddle. He tells everything to me. So listen carefully to his answer. At twelve o'clock at night, the dragon came flying in and asked for his dinner. The grandmother laid the table and served up food and drink so that he was pleased, and they ate and drank together. In the course of conversation, she asked him what kind of day he had had and how many souls he had got. Nothing went very well today, but I have laid hold of three soldiers. I have them safe. Indeed. Three soldiers, that's something, but they may escape you yet. <laughs> they are mine! I will set them a riddle, which they will never in this world be able to guess. Oh, what riddle is that? I will tell you. In the great North Sea lies a dead dogfish. That shall be their meat, and the river of a whale shall be their silver spoon and a hollow old horse's hoof shall be their wine glass. <laughs> when the dragon had gone to bed, the old grandmother raised up the stone and let out the soldier. Have you paid particular attention to everything? Yes, I believe so. I know enough, and I will be able to save myself. Then he had to go back another way through the window, secretly, and with all speed to his companions. He told them how the dragon had been overreached by the old grandmother, and how he had learned the answer to the riddle from him. Then they were all joyous and of good cheer, 
and took the whip and whipped so much gold for themselves that it ran all over the ground. When the seven years had fully gone by, the dragon came with a book, showed the signatures, and said, I will take you with me now. There you shall have a meal. If you can guess what kind of roast meat you will eat, you shall be free and released from your bargain and may keep the whip. Then the first soldier began and said, In the great North Sea lies a dead dogfish. That, no doubt, is the roast meat. The dragon grew angry and began to mutter to himself. And then he asked the second, But what will your spoon be? The rib of a whale. That is to be our silver spoon. The dragon made a wry face again and growled, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and said to the third, And do you know what your wine glass is to be? An old horse's earth is to be our wine glass. Then the dragon flew away with a loud cry and had no more power over them. But the three kept the whip, whipped as much money for themselves with it as they wanted, and lived happily to their end. The end.